Welcome to our webinar, Nine Steps to a Successful Pharmacy Sale. My name is Scott Hayton and I'm a Director and Pharmacy Consultant at Hutchings Consultants. Step number one in your successful pharmacy sale is a detailed and up-to-date valuation. This will help you to understand the value of your business and whether or not the decision to sell is the right one for you. It should be carried out by a reputable specialist pharmacy agent so you can have confidence in the result of the valuation and any subsequent decision that you make. It may sound obvious to some, but the decision to sell is not one to be taken lightly. If you do decide to sell, then you need to be committed and prepared. If you should happen to change your mind partway through the process, it can cost you in terms of aborted professional fees, but can also impact on your business, both in terms of its performance if the sale has distracted you, and its marketability when you eventually come to sell. Buyers will recall the business has been marketed previously, and this can affect market confidence in the business. Detailed analysis of pharmacy valuation methods are covered in Anne Hutching's new book, Selling Your Pharmacy for All It's Worth, and also in our previous webinars. More information on how to receive those can be found on our website. In terms of valuation, it's important that it is comprehensive in nature. The valuation you receive needs to be as comprehensive as possible for you to make a solid decision over whether to sell. Any agent's valuation figure is always going to be an opinion, with the business ultimately worth what someone out there in the market is prepared to pay for it. A good example of an acute lack of detail would be relying on your friend who sold their business for say £1.25 in the pound or 95p in the pound. Even if you're within walking distance of your friend's shop, this does not mean that your business is worth the same. There's many factors to consider and each pharmacy business is unique. Aspects such as location, lease terms, makeup of the turnover, staffing costs, bottom line profits, to name just a few factors, create huge variations in the goodwill value. So it follows then, in order for any agent to give you their informed opinion of your pharmacy's goodwill value, you'll need to provide them with a certain amount of financial information relating to the business. In the long run, there are no shortcuts here, and the better your information is, and the more you can provide, the easier it will be for the agent to give you a comprehensive assessment of value. Keeping good records and accounts is not just good business sense. It pays dividends when you come to sell the business. Good quality accounts and records mean that the appraisal process is easier, not just for the agent, but also for potential purchasers and their financial backers. This will reinforce market confidence in your business, and it can even help support a higher goodwill valuation. On the other hand, poor quality accounts and records can confuse and undermine the value of your business, and for this reason, it is well worth planning ahead. If you're considering a sale in the next few years, having a specialist agent look over the business in advance can be beneficial in highlighting problem areas and giving you the opportunity and guidance to correct and improve those before you come to market. Remember that further down the line in the sales process, buyers and lenders will generally be looking at the last three years of your pharmacy's figures. Finally, a word of caution. Aside from the financial information, a good agent should be asking you a number of detailed questions about your business in order to build up their understanding of it. You should be wary of an agent who is happy to give you an off-the-cuff valuation figure without drilling down too far, or one who insists on meeting you before they've even given you a valuation figure. Not only is this unnecessary, but foot-in-the-door type tactics are also unprofessional. The next step is understanding your tax position. Once you've discussed the valuation with an agent and are confident that you understand the potential value of your business, you need to think about your tax position and what this will ultimately be when you come to sell. You can speak to your accountant regarding this and they should be able to advise you and confirm whether or not you would qualify for any tax reliefs that are currently available. At the moment, Entrepreneurs Relief offers sellers extremely favorable rates. So it's important that you have a good accountant acting for you who is knowledgeable and comfortable advising you in these areas. There is a possibility, however, that Entrepreneurs Relief could be abolished following the election. Nothing of that nature is ever set in stone. If you're trading via a limited company, you need to decide whether the business will be sold via a company share sale, where the buyer will purchase 100% of the shares from you, or an asset sale, whereby the business or asset is sold out of the company, leaving you with a company shell and any other assets non-related to the pharmacy. The tax cost to you personally can vary substantially for each sale structure, so it is important that you get good advice in this area. The sale structure can also play a part in the desirability of the business at market 
but that is usually a secondary consideration to the tax costs. We find many instances during the course of our work where the seller's accountant does not have the tax expertise required to offer best advice to the seller. Fortunately, our expertise also extends to pharmacy tax and accountancy matters through our sister company, Hutchings & Co Accountants. Subsequently, we're always able to pick these issues up and either take over the tax matters from the seller's accountant or work alongside them, offering guidance and advice. This ensures that the seller always has the best possible tax outcome from their sale and that they retain as much of the sale proceeds as possible. In an ideal world, you should fully understand your tax position before you make the decision to sell. The next step is preparing for the sale and marketing. Unless you've made the decision very quickly, when you bring the pharmacy to market, you'll need to provide your agent with up-to-date information for the business again. Document and financials pack for buyers will generally need to consist of three years accounts, two years VAT return copies, two years NHS statement copies, preferably all the pages, a copy of the shop lease, if the freehold is to be sold, then a copy of any valuation report you have obtained. Hopefully at this stage, you and your agent will have discussed any weaknesses in the above information, and thus it will all be clear, present, and up to date. Lack of information or unclear information, such as poorly structured accounts, can result in confusion, poor offers, or difficulty in selling the business altogether. It can leave room for errors in the market's analysis of the business, which could mean that offers are restated once the true nature of the figures has been made clear. Another important point to check at this stage is the legal ownership of the NHS contract. If you are selling the shares in your company, the contract needs to be held by the target company rather than you as an individual. We had one case recently where the seller thought it was in the company name, but unfortunately it turned out not to be, and completion was delayed several months while the NHS processed a transfer of ownership, eventually allowing the deal to finally complete. With regards to any premises lease, this is probably an area that you'll be thinking is straightforward. In practice though, we see a lot of issues with leases. These are lengthy documents, often negotiated in a hurry by a local solicitor rather than the specialist, who does not necessarily understand or consider the implications of legal positions they advise on the future saleability of your business. It is wise to have the lease looked at to identify any issues that may present upon selling and where possible, correct these before coming to the market. Your pharmacy goodwill is not just tied up in the pharmacy contract that you hold, but also within the premises from which you trade. Think of it this way, no premises, no contract, no value. Your lease and premises need to be secure, renewable, transferable, and chargeable, since it is standard practice for a lending bank to take charge over the lease as security. You will also need a minimum of 10 years term left on the lease, again, a standard bank requirement. These lease matters can be dealt with during the sale, however they almost always take far longer than you might expect to negotiate and conclude, and in some cases can prolong a sale by months. During this period of delay, the seller can become highly stressed, frustrated, and they can lose focus on the business, allowing the turnover and the profits to slip. At the same time, the buyer too will become frustrated, impatient, and they can lose interest in the sale, particularly if other opportunities arise. Be prepared to communicate. It's prudent to keep a steady flow of information from seller to buyer. To do this, keep your agents supplied as you go along with the latest NHS statements and VAT return copies. This will also help to focus your mind on the business figures at a time when your attentions are naturally going to be pulled elsewhere. I can give you a real world example of how a relatively small slip up in terms of preparation can be detrimental to both your sale and your pocket. The pharmacy seller in this case was also the freehold owner and the premises included a GP partnership. After a buyer for the pharmacy was found, it was discovered that neither the freeholder nor the GPs had a signed copy of the premises lease, and so a new one needed to be established. Months of painful negotiations ensued whilst the seller was in a disadvantaged position and also trying to sell the pharmacy business. During this long period of delay, the pharmacy sale couldn't complete, and the item numbers in the pharmacy started to drop. ETP was introduced at the surgery, confusing the numbers, plus there were some competitor movements that complicated matters even further. It's a great shame that this matter was not discovered and rectified earlier in the process, as the pharmacy sale could easily have been completed before any of those subsequent issues ever came about. Appropriately, the next step is freehold property. If you own the premises freehold, you'll need to make a decision over whether to sell the freehold or whether to set up a new lease for your buyer. Your decision in this regard may be influenced by several factors. For example, the existing ownership structure. Is the property in your personal name or that of the company? The tax cost to you of either route, the status of the property market at the time of your business sale, 
Your personal preferences, for example, any reluctance to become a landlord, and the value of the freehold in relation to the size of your pharmacy business. For example, a £500,000 freehold for a £450,000 turnover business may be financially restrictive for purchasers. In this scenario, a better option could be to set up a lease for the premises in order to maximise the marketability and the goodwill value. As this point suggests, the decision to sell the freehold or to set up a lease can affect the desirability of your business overall. The opportunity to acquire freehold premises is generally attractive to market, but ultimately if you are flexible in your position as a premises owner, you'll appeal to a range of potential purchasers and this can tend to improve your chances of achieving a higher goodwill value. Lastly, you should ideally undertake a valuation from a local commercial property agent for the premises. Ask them for a value for the freehold and also for the market rent. Having both valuations may help you to decide whether you retain or sell the freehold. Any valuation that you want to take should be carried out by a firm of fair standing and ideally the figure should be presented in writing, perhaps with evidence. There's no need for an in-depth report on the structure of the building, but by asking them to put the figure in writing, you will have evidence to back up the figure in case it's questioned at a later stage by the buyer. If you're concerned about confidentiality or in order to get an accurate valuation rather than a speculative figure, you can always say that you require the valuation for your accountant. Property valuers will often give you a price range. For example, a value may be between, say, £120,000 and £140,000. By pitching your asking price at the higher end of the valuation, it will give you some room for negotiation with the buyer if necessary. Step 5 is to decide how you will actually market the business. Some people may choose to sell privately. In the current market of such high demand for pharmacy businesses, you will more than likely have been approached by one or more potential buyers expressing an interest in acquiring your business. Certain buyers who are known to us regularly send out bulk mailings to this effect. Just be aware that similar letters will also have been received by hundreds of other pharmacies using this spread the net wide technique. If a buyer can persuade you to sell directly to them, then they have you at a disadvantage and there's a stronger chance of them picking up your business at a discount value. If you're only dealing with one buyer, then you'll have no other offers against which you can gauge the level. We will often receive in the region of six or seven genuine offers for good quality pharmacies, and these will typically be presented across a range of values. If you're only dealing with one person, then you have no idea where their offer would lay within the market range or what the true maximum value of your pharmacy is. The only way to really know this is to take the business to market. Another problem when only dealing with one party is that you will have no backup interest. This puts you in a weak negotiating position which gets weaker and weaker the closer you get to completion and the more professional fees you incur. We hear a lot of stories from people who have attempted private sales only to find out at a late stage that the buyer is unable to raise funding or simply wants a reduction in price for no justified reason. Having other interested parties in the background is always a good incentive for your buyer to move them along quickly and get the deal done. Some people may prefer to use an agent to sell. A good pharmacy agent should be able to get the best price for you in the current market and there should be incentive for them to do so. Beware those agents who do not charge a fee or those who take a percentage of their fee from the buyer. At worst, these agents are not acting in your interest as a seller, and at best, they have a conflict of interest if they're being paid a fee by the buyer. The difference between selling privately and using an agent should far exceed the agent's commission, and we have many past clients who can testify to this. Here's a quick checklist of items to consider when thinking about instructing an agent. Your agent, your best interests. Ensure that your agent has no conflict of interest with the buyer and they are not assisting them in any way, thus giving you confidence that your agent is working to secure you the best price and the terms of sale. Quality buyers. Your agent should only be introducing quality, financially qualified buyers and avoiding time wasters and purely curious competitors. Expertise and experience. Pharmacy is a specialist area and you will likely only sell your business once. It really does pay to have an agent on board who is an expert in pharmacy sales and who has the knowledge and experience to confidently deal with tough issues when they arise throughout the sale. Your agent should be in control of the sale, liaising with the buyers, setting timescales for offers, and negotiating them upwards, coordinating the wholesale process effectively for you to conclude the deal as quickly as possible. Ethical advice. Aside from the standard rules and regulations governing agents, you should pick an agent who will give you sound and solid business advice to your benefit, even if that ultimately means they lose out on a fee. Trust and reputation. Go with an agent you feel that you can trust and one who has a good reputation in the market. Speak to friends and ask for testimonials.
resourceful. Choose an agent that is resourceful and tenacious to fight your corner. In the end, you'll be glad that you did. The road ahead can be bumpy, and it pays to be prepared. Again, recommendations and testimonials are the way to go here. Step six is all about confidentiality. We know that for most pharmacy sellers, confidentiality is crucial and is one of their biggest worries when planning a sale. If you're trying to deal with the sale all by yourself, you may find it difficult to maintain the confidentiality as you'll be dealing with the whole process of marketing and liaising with the buyers, whilst also trying to manage your business on a day-to-day -day basis. In such a high demand market, buyers can be frantic and persistent phone calls to the shop or your mobile are unlikely to go unnoticed. This would be an undesirable situation for any seller. In this scenario, it's easy for the seller to become distracted. Unusual goings on can also distract and unsettle the staff, so there's a real possibility of performance slipping, which brings with it a host of problems from price renegotiations to aborted sales. A good agent will listen to your concerns and take your confidentiality very seriously. They should have signed confidentiality agreements in place with every potential purchaser before releasing any of your business information to them. They should be in control of communications so that you're only contacted at times of your choosing and by a method that suits you. Appointments should also be arranged at times to suit you, i.e. outside of working hours. This will avoid any awkward run-ins or suspicions from the staff. If you're using a good agent to deal directly with the buyers, your contact will be limited and this will reduce the chance of your staff becoming suspicious. When choosing an agent, ask them about their confidentiality policies. Ask if they have a code of conduct for buyers and if they keep a blacklist for anyone who has breached this. Step seven relates to the offers process. Firstly, how many offers should you expect? Well, without the day-to-day -day experience of the buying and selling market, this will be difficult for you to gauge as each pharmacy sale is unique. A good agent will know from experience what to expect and how long to market the business for before calling in the offers. Whilst demand is very high at the moment, there are always pharmacies that are difficult to sell, and this may be for numerous reasons. For example, the NHS items are low compared to the OTC trade, or the rent may be restrictively high. There could be uncertainties around the local GPs casting doubt over the future of the pharmacy profitability. An experienced agent will give you an honest appraisal of your pharmacy business before you commit, along with some insight into what you can expect. Currently, we're achieving an average of six to seven serious offers on desirable pharmacies. For what the market would perceive to be particularly desirable opportunities, this number can rise higher, perhaps 10 to 12 serious offers, but we still maintain a sharp focus on the confidentiality of the marketing. So how long should you market before calling offers in? Ultimately, each sale is different. It depends on the business makeup and its location within the UK. Whilst it's possible to sell a pharmacy within days of it going to market, to achieve the best possible price for the seller, a little patience is required. Realistically, even serious buyers will need to receive and digest the information provided before they can make decisions about it. Usually, they will want to consult with their accountants and financial advisors. Remember, obtaining serious offers is the objective here. You don't want people making frivolous offers, and so it is important for buyers to be given adequate time to carry out their research and arrange funding before they table an offer. The last thing that you want is to get to the stage of solicitors where you start incurring costs only to find out that the buyer can't raise the required finance to meet their offer. Sadly, people do make frivolous offers, but a good agent will have the experience and processes in place to spot these individuals and take appropriate action. This is why thorough vetting of potential purchasers' finance at the early stage is so important. On average, you can expect around eight weeks of marketing and offers negotiation before moving to sale agreed and solicitors. This can be quicker for those particularly desirable opportunities, for example, some of the London sales which can be agreed and with solicitors within four weeks. It's important to judge the situation and the buyers carefully before setting any timescales. Step eight, solicitors and timescales to completion. Appointing an experienced pharmacy solicitor is an extremely important step towards a quick and smooth sale and arguably an imperative one. The sale of your pharmacy business is usually a once in a lifetime event. It's not a residential matter, and so it certainly shouldn't be passed to a residential solicitor. In the same vein, it's not a typical business sale either. There are some specialist aspects of the legal process unique to pharmacy, and these would only be understood by those commercial solicitors with experience in this field. Using another form of solicitor who is inexperienced is short-sighted really, because it can cause you delays, certainly stress, and it could even end up costing you the sale. Clearly you will want to minimize your legal costs, but it shouldn't be your only consideration. Once you have found your buyer and a top price, it is in your interest to complete the sale as quickly as possible. A sale that should be completed in, say, three months can take 12 months with poor legal representation. 
This is a dangerous position for any seller because a protracted sale can have costly repercussions. Two of the main considerations are, firstly, legal fees can escalate and a solicitor who seemed very cheap at the start can end up being very costly by the time the sale eventually completes. Secondly, the longer a sale goes on, the larger the window of opportunity for some unknown factor to present and destroy the sale. It could be that the buyer eventually loses interest, a local surgery announces a move, or perhaps there is some sort of legislation change that affects the figures and profitability of the business going forwards. A timescale should be agreed between the buyer and seller beforehand, at the point at which the offer is being accepted. At the same time, the timescale should also be agreed with the solicitors representing each party and their accountants too, so that both sides and the respective advisors are all working towards a clear target date. Your agent should then be liaising with all parties, including the NHS and the lenders, to ensure that all timescale targets are being met and everything comes together for a completion date. With some sales, this can be a full-time task in itself. We have a panel of experienced pharmacy solicitors based across the UK whom we are happy to recommend based upon their knowledge, experience and their ability to close deals both quickly and successfully for their clients. The last step, step 9, is paperwork. There's certainly lots of it, so be prepared in the first instance for detailed questions about your business. Whether you are selling 100% of your company's shares or you're selling the assets of your sole trade business, once the sale is agreed and into the legal stage, one of the first tasks to undertake is the buyer's due diligence questionnaires. This can often cause some frustration with sellers, as the process can be tedious and time-consuming. It is, however, totally normal and to be expected with any business sale and any buyer. Try to be objective. If you were buying a business for a million pounds, would you not want some assurances and guarantees? In addition, it's not just the purchaser who needs to satisfy themselves that everything is in order, but also the buyer's financial backers. They will want to be sure that the business can afford the loan repayments. In general, you and your advisors will need to respond to three main types of queries, those being commercial, financial and property related. This due diligence process forms a reasonable proportion of the overall legal timescale and dealing with this aspect quickly as a seller can drastically reduce the length of your sale overall. When we are acting for sellers, we take a proactive approach and we do our best to help our clients understand what kinds of information will be requested in advance so that some of this can be gathered or dug out of the loft. With some sales that we handle, clients have paperwork relating to the business scattered across various locations and so it can be really helpful to think about this process in advance. It may also be prudent to anticipate taking two or three days out of the pharmacy to respond to all of these questions in one hit. You'll find that this approach allows you to focus and work your way through the questionnaire much quicker than if you were to do an hour here and there. It will also be far less stressful and frustrating for you. A swift approach responding to all queries in one hit rather than a piecemeal approach will also help the solicitors to maintain their focus on the deal and therefore help to streamline your costs and progress the sale quicker. I've said it many times during the course of this webinar, but the longer that your sale takes to complete, the higher the chances are that it will fall through. Thanks very much for listening and taking part this evening. We're always very happy to provide a free evaluation for anyone who's thinking of selling their pharmacy or their group. If you'd like to have a chat about the market, you can always give Anne or myself a call, in total confidence of course. Our contact details are on the screen. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to the webinar this evening. I hope you've all found it informative and I look forward to speaking to you in the future. Good evening.